that's actually that's pretty good we could do that uh Giles Cockland so tell me about yourself uh first tell me who you are and what you're doing and uh where you play a role in the market well I'm basically a commentary analyst which has really been understanding market dynamics and then explaining that in a way that can be understood to to, to a broadcasting world, really. That's oh, the, the niche that oh, I'm moving perfect. in. So this, and, and uh, um, you are obviously a market analyst for, um, what is it, uh, HYCM, is it? HYCM. Well, okay. I write most of their content. Perfect. I, write, I, I pretty much write all that. So I've got a question that's on everyone's <laughs> mind right now. What the fuck is going on in the world right now? That is what everyone at home is thinking. Okay. What is going on in the world? You know, people are looking at things and they're going, wait a minute, you've got stocks. Are they overvalued? Are they undervalued? Yeah. You've got uh, crazy yeah. assets like cryptocurrencies uh, that seem to be all over the yeah. place. You've got properties that aren't declining yeah. in value. You've got so much uh, money supply uh, printing in the US. I mean, it is like what fifty percent of all dollars in circulation well, since since. To, so there's Dan, they're all linked. Okay, so th so they're all linked. So what is first of all what's going on? Like what what could have what what insanity could have possibly produced this? Yes. What 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 is going essentially, on? Essentially, yeah. hmm. but essentially. All those different markets are different expressions of the same thing, which is the buy everything mantra. We have a perfect condition for investment, which is very low interest rates, huge amounts of fiscal stimulus. We have governments taking on huge amounts of debt, which is enabling to cushion the blow from COVID-19 but it also means there's a huge amount of money in the markets. And so markets are desperate to put that money somewhere. So is it cryptocurrencies? Is it property? Is it uh, companies that are just insured about, against uh, going under? So that's why we're seeing all this inflation, inflated markets. And it's essentially that very easy, loose monetary policy conditions that we're in. And that's why the buy everything mantra is here. And that's why we suddenly saw commodities fall sharply when the Federal Reserve seemed to take a hawkish shift last week, because that was essentially the, the market saying, oh, no, the party's over. The buy everything mantra you see, this is, is no this longer. Is a bit of I'm, I'm the guy, uh, you know, who uh, sometimes I make about 50 grand on a good year in the market. Um, on a bad year, I probably lose about 110. And on my best year, I made about 220K, right? So I haven't done badly. And, you know, when I hear that, I go, right, okay, that, that makes us the buy everything thing. So if, if, if I'm going to uh, try and make sense of it, there seems to be two different arguments. One is that I should buy, I've got my friends on the left-hand side who would say, on the right-hand side, who are saying, they're saying, look, what you want to buy is equity and property and put your stuff in income generating assets. Stuff, yeah. stuff that's generating income. And then I've got yeah. my, uh, you know, perhaps younger friends um, who, who, who are telling me, look, you're absolutely mad to buy all that income stuff, right? Buy the cryptocurrencies, yeah. buy, the, buy, the, buy the GMEs or whatever, buy the, buy the Wall Street best stuff. Are you saying that buy a bit of everything and spread your portfolio across that? Um, or are you saying no? Would be I, was ex I was ex I was explaining something completely different. Mm. I was explaining to you how we got into this oh, current okay. market condition. That's so okay. I was explaining to you why we are where we're at now. <laughs> you know yeah. what we the should advice. do. So this is a very is important factor. Right? Right? Like the advice is very different to the analysis. So the, we have the analysis. This is we are in a buy yeah. everything market so that does environment mean, right environment but you should buy everything <laughs> right okay okay that yeah that, exactly that so very key 
Oh, that's, abs that's absolutely key. So if, say for instance, you were looking at something, what, what is good value at the moment? I'd mm -hmm. say that one of the world's indices that is still good value is the FTSE 100. If you look at the global indices, you'll see that all the major ones have filled what I call the COVID-19 gap. Is Boris Johnson gap. doing such a bad job about encouraging foreign direct investment? It's I mean, why, why, is it why, why, is the, why is the FTSE so well valued? That means that it hasn't been bought up as much as the other market. It's the morning after the night before, and essentially it's all a hangover from Brexit. Remember how long Brexit was going on, and remember there was a genuine fear amongst investors that a hard Brexit would make the UK uninvestable. So there's a huge amount of equity that was removed, and investors didn't put m money into the UK because of that fear of a hard Brexit. That's now trailing off. There is still some negotiation to be uh, done with the EU. So we're not completely out of the woods. But I think if, if there was one to buy and forget about, I think the FTSE 100 filling 7,500 before year end would be something that makes a lot of sense to me. So, so, so you like something that- Along any other global industries. Okay, so you prefer something that's pretty well valued uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, you're, you're saying it's a buy everything environment, but that doesn't mean buy everything. Yeah. It means look carefully, does it? Uh, at what's at where where the no, it are. means I'm waiting for the markets to crash. Ah, does it? Okay. Because so so what 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 yeah. what are we expecting? This is an interesting one. So let's say should, should yeah, I put absolutely. my money in cash? No. So this when I'm analysing the markets and I'm obviously I trade actively. Mm. So take for instance, um, like the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ or the Dow. So broadly speaking, the financial conditions for we have low interest rates, yeah. we have broad fiscal stimulus. Mm -hmm. So that means I want to look at very careful, carefully chosen technical areas where I can limit my risk to the minimum. Okay. So that if, the mainstream narrative keeps going because you, it's difficult to know, isn't it? How long's a piece of string? How extreme, long will conditions remain? And, and it's also extremely tough to know what's what's. So we're in a buy everything market because there's been so much money printed and it's all gone into these assets. I think I'm yes. sort of getting there. You've got it. Um, and then the, I'm, I'm wondering where all these are, are these other you know so. I, then you're saying there's traditional assets that are income assets that may be overpriced, but some may be uh, low valued, and you may want to look at some of them as sort of cherry picking. The FTSE 100 is, is one that I think offers good value. FTSE 100, we think, is a, is a great index, and you pretty much throw a dart, put it away for 10 years, and you're going to be all right. So the, uh, or five years. Yeah, that's what I'd say with that one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So then on the other side, you've got these uh, cash vehicles and cryptocurrencies and you know are these yes. uh, are these uh, something different altogether or are these I mean, where do these oh, come into the picture i mean do i buy them this is this is in, well, first of all cryptocurrencies to me make sense as an expression of the digital acceleration we've seen that was accelerated due to covid19 People working remotely, um, people buying remotely. It's a really nice honesty. People, hmm. people look looking at that digital world. Do so you mean as everyone sudden, was shut indoors mandatorily and they were yeah. on their screens like we are yeah. now instead of in person? Yeah. Everything went more digital, yeah. and that hyper digitization translated over to creation. And what's the expression? It's, it's cryptocurrencies. Now, for me, the um, I'm not like a crypto believer and I'm not a crypto naysayer. Mm -hmm. I, I'm somewhere kind of in between. I can see the potential use of cryptocurrencies. I can see the benefits. I also look at the volatility of cryptocurrency and I think the Financial Conduct Authority was very sensible to restrict the access for retail traders into the cryptocurrency markets at the moment due how, to the huge volatility how, how, how and, the lever, and, 
Well, the FCA have actually discouraged UK investors from investing directly into Bitcoin. Right. Okay. And I think they've been very sensible to do it because as soon as you use leverage with an asset like Bitcoin, um, the average retail investor, if they don't understand leverage, will find themselves uh, losing life, life savings. Right. Over, you but know, do they need years. leverage if they're buying cryptocurrencies? Can they just buy the cryptocurrency? No, not if they're buying it. Not if they're buying it directly, but it's been a, it has had a toxic attraction across multi, uh, certain social, social media for people who are trying to take advantage of an emergence of a new market. Now, I think over time, I think the more places where you can use Bitcoin, if you and I, um, Dan, can buy a pizza using Bitcoin, if we can buy a pair of jeans buying Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin has a chance of, of making it for the long haul. But when we see Bitcoin losing 80% of value on its runs higher, it means that practically speaking, it is not a practical asset to actually uh, use or hold. Um, so I would want to see the market stabilize. You mean because as an institutional investor, the, the risk is just way too high for you to be able to explain to them, even if you made 500%, your investors are going to be like, but you took this much risk. So you it's took, you took so much risk that I could have lost 90% of my money. And so you're fired. You, you, you just, you're just terrible. Is, is, it was, is, that what would happen in reality. As an institution, you're an institutional investor. What would happen if you put, you know, say 25% of the portfolio on cryptocurrencies and it went up 1,000%. It would be a negative thing with it. It would be an extreme negative thing. Interesting. I, I think a lot of people don't understand this. They think about, oh, the, 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 the acceleration is so fast. So institutional guys will want to get in. But why would it be a negative thing? Because the risk would be just so extreme. Yeah, it's all about risk. Um, you know, when you're managing larger amounts of money, you, you can't sort of swagger into the office and say, oh, yeah. guys, you know, I lost 60 percent of that hundred million account last week. But don't worry, I'm going to make it back this week. I've got a cracking one. You know, you're going to be look like you're insane, you know, like you're literally a lunatic. So it's inconceivable. And, you know, I've made my like my whole career is channeled to not be like that. Does that make sense? I, I mean, I want every it's part of it's not fascinating. To be so stabilization like of the cryptocurrency markets would definitely attract more institutional investors yes. than, than this yes. current, you but know. Proliferation. Proliferation is key. How, how does prol so what, we what have proliferation? Well, when PayPal were making it easier okay. for people to use Bitcoin. So the payment thing is a very important payment. thing as well, I'm getting the impression. The fact that it's for used sure. for a payment. Well, I mean, a lot of people there's say no store of value. You can't so I put my money in it and I store my value. And, and there's some logic to that, right? Over five year periods, the thing's consistently done this uh, loop. But do you, do you feel that um, as a store of value- <laughs> that's, that's not a loop. <laughs> that's quite a roller coaster, Dan. We're, 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 hitting a, we're hitting a Ponzi model uh, a little too closely. Do you feel that, uh, you know, for the store of value no. argument to be justified? Or do you not feel no, the Ponzi I, argument is justified? No, 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 no. I think it's, I think cryptocurrencies are legitimate. I can see their potential place and they do make sense in a digital world. Hmm. Also, the idea of like deregulated finance, I think is attractive and appealing. So I'm not against cryptocurrencies. I don't think it's a scam. I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme, even though it will attract people who are involved in that. But then any strong market will to some extent. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not opposed to it. I don't think it's a Ponzi scheme. I think it's offering a legitimate service. But you're saying that it can only get to a certain point of growth unless it starts broadening out in terms of uh, how it's used. Uh, presumably, you know, you, new user adoption. Is that a problem for cryptocurrencies versus other assets such as, say, properties or equities? I mean, I don't know what the, the figures are for new user adoption. Is, is, is it very different? I mean, I don't know the exact figures for new user adoption, but I'm just trying to think if you speak to anyone. Sort of intuitive, guess, intuitive guess from what you see in the market. Are there more new users? Are there more new equity buyers every year than there are new cryptocurrency buyers? Yeah, I mean, it is. It is a growing, 
mm. area for sure. But it is not I still mean, not growing as fast um, as, uh, say, some parts of the equity market or property market. No, I think that that's still way more accessible for people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. I um, think I agree with that. I mean, from what I've seen, there's there's a lot less yeah. growth. It seems to be the same crowd of people in it, you know, uh, every year and a, a few uh, few extras. And, and there's a lot of uh, churn, right? So there's a lot of people who come in and then don't stay in, whereas equities, they might come in and they start playing them and they keep playing them and they play more and more. And more. It's much more accessible. I mean, if you look at China, they are... People's Bank of China are discouraging their financial institutions from facilitating crypto payments. Now, that was the news that has sent Bitcoin down through 30,000. So, yeah, you know, but aren't we meant to be at war with China or something? I see, you know, isn't it, isn't it a negative for China, a good, good, good for the world sort of thing? And the, you know, there's a lot of people who no. think along these lines. And I, I no. tend to think that the Chinese are causing, you know, a fair amount of trouble. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people who do. Would, would you say that's probably uh, to putting it too simplistically then? Yeah, I mean, I'm not criticizing what you're saying, Dan. At oh, all, no, no, I'm feel saying, free to criticize. I'm interested in the people. It's that proliferation argument. You know, you think China, the world's second largest economy, mm. are shutting down their crypto uh, payments. That's a huge amount of people. I remember, uh, cryptocurrencies are meant to be deregulated. So in one sense, everyone's meant to be on a level playing field. So it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be, uh, you know, nationalistic as it were. Sure. So it's a, it's a blow to the ideal. Well, I cannot, I cannot get to this point in the discussion without asking you. So what's going on with Elon Musk and Doge and, and that Do Do Doge and, and Doge coin and the Doge. Bitcoin on his Tesla balance sheet? Um, is this, you know, what do, I, do you have any views on it? Well, I mean, Elon Musk, a fantastic entrepreneur. I, I, I love the guy. I love the guy when he had that um, big van and he got that steel ball and he threw that steel ball and it smashed yep. the window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, this is, this is, look He's at sending it. rockets into space. Yeah. He's making cars go faster than they've ever gone before. He's mm. making a hundred mistakes a day, but every day he's, going a little bit further. So I love the spirit, the entrepreneurial oh. spirit of the fellow. I think sometimes he's moving so quickly that there's gonna be collateral damage just due to the speed which he's operating. And I think maybe his adoption of Bitcoin and then his pulling back from Bitcoin did create havoc in the cryptocurrency market. Do you think that's a natural entrepreneurial just move without any, without any proper controls around it? So the entrepreneur is just moving on I instinct. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not saying he's moving without proper controls. Mm. It's just simply he's moving so quickly that for, a, uh, uh -huh. you know, most entrepreneurs, if they're moving quickly, they make a mistake and two or three people are affected. But when, you know, you, you have how many millions of followers on Twitter and sure. you're influential and you say sure. something like... Oh, so oh, you're saying like you mistakes things. that happen every day within entrepreneurial organizations. You're just seeing them happen to be blown up on yeah. media. And, and actually any it's business- just writ looks, large. Okay. It's just writ large. And it's, it's a constant, which is a series of mini failures. So I think Elon Musk, that's obviously one of the difficulties someone like Elon Musk uh, faces. So I'm talking about deliberately the tweets he was using about Tesla accepting Bitcoins and then not accepting Bitcoins. That very fast U-turn did create significant volatility in the Bitcoin market. Also, his adoption of Dogecoin and his, his differing views that sort of developing means that it's created vol even more volatility in cryptocurrencies. That's probably not helpful for the long-term nature that, of cryptocurrency. Is that a part of the same digital sort of you, we've got this kind of the, thematic thing we got the um we got this buy everything market like you said you know there's there's all this money being printed and so there's money sloshing around yeah. because of stimulus and what happened we've got uh people locked in homes so they're going digital and that's bringing about all sorts of new behaviors financial behaviors and trends yeah 
Is this yep. a part of some of that as well? Because these entrepreneurs have media exposure and attention that they wouldn't, you know, if someone's in front of the TV more often, presumably they're going to be, um, they're going to be uh, watching, you know, what's on it uh, more. And that means that those personalities like Elon Musk get to project their message. So, or is that, or, or perhaps the media is just, looking for more content to, to 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 put out i don't know but is this another function of it i, I mean, mean is, is, yeah. is, this, is this a point yeah. entrepreneurs are yeah. or is this something different yeah. is, i think there's different things there i mean i was reading a book by john yates called fractured recently okay now john yates is a very interesting character and he talks about why uh, look it up uh, dan if you're not familiar with it but it's uh, oh. it's been getting some exposure here in the uk and John Yates um, founded an organization. I did work um, under John at one stage, and he analyzes the reasons for the fractured nature of society. And a lot of it he puts down to, well, a part of it he puts down to this um, kind of intensity of voice on social media. So you tend to be surrounded by people like you. So in other words, the bigger an environment you go to, the more you gravitate towards people like you. So it was found that students who went to a bigger school tended to surround themselves with other students who were just like them. With students who went to a smaller school tended to be naturally more diverse. Now on social media, it becomes intense that you tend to gravitate towards people who are sent essentially echo chambering your thoughts, which means you become stronger and more kind of defiant in your own thoughts because of the almost the intensified intensification that did you support media. the for and against and, and that, that whole polemic. Yes. And that's, and that's <laughs> mm, magnetic. Polemic. And I think that does have an impact in it's obviously going to have an impact in business and in markets. You look at the meme stocks. Look at the intensification. All of a sudden, people gravitated together and people thought they were working like a team to kind of keep up GameStop. You know, if you looked at the Reddit crowd, I was following. Was there any um, substance behind any of this trading or was it just literally market manipulation or is, there, is it yet to be seen? So, say that again, Danny. What was it? So, was there any substance behind this trading uh, in GameStop and these Wall Street bets? Uh, yes, yeah, there was. Cool. But it then attracted, it then became a life in itself. And then it attracted people. So, in, you're saying the it, extremities are the, the outer yeah. extremities. And that's where we're in the outer extremity phase. That's why you're waiting for the market crash, I guess. Well, the market crash, a slightly different topic, mm. is that I think. Um, as soon as we start getting interest rates increasing, that for me will be the, the death knell of some of these companies rising. Okay. Because as soon as debt becomes more expensive to finance- How far are we away? Well, I, it's, it's how long is a piece of string? Yeah. So I don't know the timing, hmm. but I could, you know, it's like, I don't know exactly what time it's gonna rain, but I can see the condition of the clouds. Right, we so, are gonna have to raise interest rates, are we? Well, this is another issue, isn't it? Because to what extent has globalization impacted inflation? So the fact, that, Daniel, that you, know, you could do a digital job in yeah. Beirut, in Bangladesh, or in a are naturally going to be depressed because there's, we're trying to find a, a global wage. It's not like all of a sudden you have to work in this vicinity. Right. So that means that wages will naturally have a leveling out and we're not going to get necessarily that wage pressure to start boosting inflation. We also have automation. So we can make more and more and more for less and less and less. So it is beyond question that we've had deflationary pressures in place for years now. Look at Japan, very low inflation, um, you know, still very low inflation. High savings rate, so, lots of Japanese with cash in the bank. Now, people who are wise heads say inflation is coming. 
And it's a question of not if, but when. So when that is, again, I don't know. Is it five years, 15 years, 20 years? I'm not sure. So we're on but a something point, time bomb that will one day go off. And what, what happens when this inflation hits? I well, mean, I'm not you know, this is a stupid question, but I've never lived through an inflationary economy, uh, funny enough. Uh, you, 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 know, you, you know about economics, right? You can... Yeah. I mean, 70s and 80s, I mean, if I think back to, to my mum and dad, yeah, they okay. were paying around 16% on their money. Oh, that's true. That's true. It has been inflationary because 80s, <laughs> you get a pack of cigarettes. Now, I spoke to my mum. I was speaking to my mum and dad. I was speaking to my mum, you know, not long ago. And she was saying it was a very hard time because we, we almost went under. So when debt becomes more expensive to manage, what have we been doing, Daniel, over the last 10 years? Printing more money. What have we been? <laughs> why are we buying everything? Because we've been adding to our debt. We've been adding to our debt as... How does this work then? The government yeah. prints the money and then the bank yeah. and then puts it on, somehow gets it to the bank's balance sheets, presumably by lending it to them. And then the banks lend it out further but so they have more money to lend and they lend and they make more money. And so the credit supply increases. So this is all sort of a broad inflation in a way, right? This is a, there's this guy at the back printing and then it lends to the, all these other guys and then they lend yeah. at a higher interest rate. And then all those guys go out and spend it and have to pay it back. And then, you know, there's this sort of cycle that keeps increasing. Can that go on forever? Well, this is an interesting point. I mean, I was uh, having a chat with Nick Ferrari and he, he was um, on um, LBC in the UK. Yeah. And he was saying, you know, this is, um, you know, he was, he was trying to put, he was putting to me uh, the premise um, that we're addicted to debt. Yeah. And, it just, it just struck me, made a very good point. So what it struck me, I thought, okay, but what are most people's mortgages? How many times earnings can most people borrow for a mortgage? I'm thinking it's three or four times, okay? So if you think that's with an individual, that's with an individual. Okay. Now, when you have a country, you are a lot less vulnerable than an individual because you have in the UK, you know, 65 plus million individuals. So all doing different things and what have doing you. doing different things, right? Yeah. So, okay, UK's debt to GDP ratio is about 100%. What is to no, say- No conservative amount. <laughs> but you, you're right. The, but what's to what say is to cannot say, have 300%? What, yeah, what is to say that that can't go up to two, three hundred? Oh, I see. Because you're already three hundred percent in terms of your mortgage versus income, why couldn't you go three hundred percent debt to GDP? Uh, and of course, there's always Africa to develop uh, and other parts of the world, Latin America, um, that presumably would would start producing all this income that would swallow up a lot of that inflation, right? So, so <laughs> there's a, there's a lot. So if we get developing in the other world part of the world fast enough. Uh, then that might be uh, an alter that might be a certainly an avenue to offsetting the inflation. In terms of the, the green stuff, I wanted to ask you about finally. Yeah, you're a macro guy, so you're going to know all about the green stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got two sets of friends. One set of friend tells me <laughs> this is a scam. Yeah, and government yeah. ministers are basically just ripping off the money supply to get get it funding for things. And another group of friends tell me that basically that. My other group of friends is a murderers and, you know, everyone's going to die of, um, of global warming. And this is a very important problem. Where does, uh, where does, the, where, where does the reality lie there? Um, you, you just froze part uh, through that. Could you just say, oh, sorry. I, 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 say I got one friend, not the other. Okay. So I got the, uh, so the other friend say that, you know, everyone who says that uh, is a scam are basically murderers um, because, you know, global warming is a, well, they're Greta Thunberg, yeah. So like, the, I've got Greta Thunberg and okay. I've got, and I've got, and I've got um, Donald Trump. So these two, these two characters, right? Got couldn't you. be more opposed to, couldn't be more opposed to different, where does the reality lie with uh, with the green thing? Is it is it um, is it a scam perpetuated by government ministers in order to suck up uh, money, free money, 
or is it a, a genuine concern for something that actually has an economic and social effect? I think, you know, without a shadow of a doubt, using our resources carefully in a way that is mo most efficient and is having least impact on the environment around us is, is simply a, a, a question of common sense and efficiency for me. Mm -hmm. So something like it, so the greener a technology is, the less environmental impact it has, the better for the, for the globe's health in terms of the environment and the better for individuals who are having to live. But does the environment the really world. matter? But do we actually notice, are there, are there social impacts that actually are recorded? I mean, I can't remember anyone's yeah. priority. I think a lot of people find the environment hard to focus on when they have their mortgage to pay, for example. Yeah. Um, or, so, th so that might imply that it was more of an economic uh, issue. I mean, if we, uh, is, there, is there an economic necessity to have a green policy put in place uh, or an economic need or an economic advantage? Well, I, I used to live just inside the inner ring road of, of Birmingham, the second city here in the okay. UK. Yeah. And in that inner city ring road, uh, there was a primary school local to me that was adjacent to the ring road. Okay. So all the children who were playing in that park were right next to a very busy city ring road. Okay. The instances of asthma in that environment were extremely high. So those okay, that's, so it, so there is a there is a real there is a real tangible. Oh yeah, yeah, and, and just oh, to, yeah. and the UK is often quite good for this, isn't it? Because there's a lot of people in a very squashed area, so we can see these types of effects very easily and very quickly, and that it, it's often quite a good test pad. So there oh, is yeah. there, there, there is a substantial um, need to to uh, to reduce the amount of toxins we're throwing into the air for people's health. Yeah. Oh. You know, I think it's just for me, it's just a question. You had the option of of having a diesel, you know, 10 diesel cars operating within five yards of you for your working day mm. or 10 electric cars operating mm. within mm. five yards of your working day. Which one would you want? I know I'd want the electric vehicle. Now, it's not all Shangri-La. There's always hazards and risks in life. Unfortunately, that's the way. But the more we can limit them, the, the better. That's the way that, that, that I see it. And certainly a lot of governments are thinking that way. And copper does stand to gain significantly over the medium to long term and has done since March. To, I've been writing about it on my blog for quite copper some time. Copper because it's about a, what, where, where does copper get used? Copper is so useful because it conducts electricity. Oh, so I see. And that's, wiring. that's okay. Anything so so that's copper, copper prices are likely to move higher up. Oh, they a, a lot of that move has taken place now, and it was taking place okay. from about sort of six, seven, eight months ago. Um, if, I, if I miss so, the copper you know, run, is there any? Is there any other other sort of interesting? You know, I mean, um, maybe nickel. Aluminum. Maybe nickel over the medium term. Nickel, okay. Yeah. So aluminum. Nickel, maybe vehicles. I'm not so, so sure in aluminum. So, 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 um, you know, let's say I was going to go back to my my portfolio here. Uh, to finish, yes. so I'm going to get fifty grand. Right? Well, I've got a hundred grand inheritance coming in. Let's say. All right. Yeah. Okay, lovely. Well done. Let's say I put fifty. How much am I going to put into the FTSE 100? Fifty grand. Yeah, I think that would be reasonable. I, I think maybe I would, pro yeah, I think about 50 grand would be good yeah. for the FTSE 100. So then, then um, and then maybe buy some, it sounds like these foreign, uh, co 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 you said copper and, uh, and nickel mining companies might, might not be a bad bet for some uh, overseas exposure. I, I wouldn't. Or you wouldn't, I, or you wouldn't touch them now. No, I wouldn't touch it now. I think that's um, too. I think that cryptocurrencies is gone. Am I going to put any cryptocurrencies gone down just this week? A lot of people want to buy them up. Or would you leave them? No, I, I tell you. I tell you what. I, I tell you what I do is if I was looking, say, say I want to look at Bitcoin, I'll tell you. I tell you how I'd look for it. 
Yeah. I'm just, gonna, I'm just looking at the chart now. And I'm just looking, because what I like to do is just find areas of value. Right. So if I look, if you go back from March 2020, yeah. you can see there's a low from September 2020. And yeah. there's a trend line that extends up around $20,000. Yeah, there is. Now, I'd say I, say I had £100,000. Yeah. I'd invest 5000 at $20,000. Right. But I would exit if we got back down to say twelve thousand dollars okay and where and 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 then if it goes running up just keep it playing on and uh you know happy days right if it runs up just just trail keep it an eye below on below the next swing yeah. point each time there's a swing point just put your stop below the swing point and okay, so 20 k i'm in. gonna buy five and, and the rest the rest uh i'm gonna keep in cash just on the sidelines waiting for that market you can cash and wait for markets to crash and wait for you and I to do another interview and you tell me that this Absolutely. is the worst yeah. time ever and it's terribly bleak and there's nothing to invest in and then yeah. I say Daniel remember that cash that you've got under your bed <laughs> yeah, well, now's the time to get it out. yeah yeah that's 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 very <laughs> interesting so, so that's so so cryptocurrencies and cash are two different things uh equities uh in the UK FTSE 100 are very different to equities in the US um, and yeah, equities in Asia or whatever. So you want to be very careful about how you're looking at these different, just because it's equities doesn't mean go and buy equities, doesn't mean go and buy, you know, um, one, one asset class just because it sounds similar. And I think a lot of people, people do get confused with that with so many new asset classes. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And people need to realize that actually think about it, all those very low interest rates, all that government money has been propping up a lot of companies that perhaps wouldn't survive without the government support. So and you're a bit of an optimist actually about this, which I, I, I think is interesting in the sense that, you know, you see a lot of people saying, well, the government's basically torn society apart and made it, a, you know, a, for want of a better word, a, a, a financial brothel, you know, or casino. But actually, you have this sort of view, which is interesting, if I've understood it correctly, that's, that it started something that we don't know the end of yet. And actually, it's way too early to start predicting the beginning of the end. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, completely. It's very easy to be... ...careers. You know, the, the end is coming, yeah. the end is coming. Yeah. I think, yes, you all know the end is eventually coming, but it's just a question of, of when and being sensible along the journey rather than having an all in or an, uh, an all out mentality. So there's a whole, so there's these, and, and of course these different paradigms happening, the digitalization of things, the printing of money, uh the the new yes. those new lot of traders entering the people working from home these things uh patience would be would be your advice would it to in order to see how that plays out rather than make sort of hard and fast uh, you know affirmation. daniel one of the I'm, I'm always teaching aspiring traders uh, mm. this very sim simple principle that you combine fundamentals and technicals so fundamental and as a macro guy, I might have a fundamental view on something. Now, there's a problem with a macro trader, which is that if, it, if the price goes against you 20%, it's better value. If it goes against you 40%, it's even better value. And if price goes against you 80%, it's the bargain of the century. Now, the problem with that, Daniel, is not practical because the market can be irrational longer than you can stay solvent. Right. So my what I advocate is enter sensible places and exit in sensible places like i described with you with bitcoin yes if you want to have a chunk of the market price where you get in price where you get out be yeah. strict limit yeah. your risk yeah. and that way you can keep coming long term and every now and then you're going to hit one or two good trades so in my personal trading account last year i made about 22 23 percent and most of those trades uh, most of that profit came from about three or four trades over the year. Okay. So every now and then you get a real good runner. And mm. that's what you want to do. Mm. Limit the risk, cut your losses short, let 
let your winners run. Yeah, what's and the sort of holding it? period you should hold on to an asset for to minimum, minimum, maximum? I mean, you know. No, 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 no. I don't advocate that at all, um, okay. Daniel. Now, if you're straight take, if you're trading stocks for your retirement, just buy, hold, forget about them. Okay, right. that that's probably the sensible thing to do. Mm. But if you're actively trading like I am, um, different markets will move at different speeds and you need to be reactive to that market. You okay. can't be it's, saying, oh, you can't, you know, can't I never expect to trade in six weeks. You, you react, okay? Mm. Um, but what I would say, I think, Daniel, if you imagine that you and I were running a country, yeah. and if you imagine... Well, we might do one day, you know. Well, Daniel... It's <laughs> a possibility. I, Same country. <laughs> But, but you yes. know, eventually yeah. what we're going to say, what we're going to say is we're going to say, look, hang on. Um, all these young people and all these people have taken out mortgages on their houses yeah. when interest rates were like 2% uh -huh. and they maxed out their mortgage. So what are we going to say? Are we going to say we're going to allow interest rates to rise out of control so that half the population lose their homes? No, we're not. We're going, to, we're going to readjust the system. By cryptocurrencies. <laughs> but we're going to readjust the system. There'll be a political... Yeah. Look at the political pressure. So this is going to be a political thing where there will be... What will happen then? There'll have to be a reset or some sort of law put into place that says you cannot raise interest rates above this level. And then, and then the country cannot raise interest rates. And then, so you have to transform from a borrowing... I mean, this is... Well, you it, can't, it, it wouldn't work like that because the moment you tell people um, you can't raise interest rates, <laughs> right, they'll, they'll, be, they'll be fearing inflation and then the fear of inflation itself is enough to stoke inflation. Because if you and I, Daniel, thought if we thought, you know, the, the money we've earned this month is going to be worth less in one week's time, we'd spend everything we have today. And that itself yeah. would drive inflation. Yeah, so the yeah. fear of inflation itself is enough to drive inflation. So what happens at this point where the where 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 the crunch happens, you know, with respect to this low interest debt, suddenly you're saying it's adjusting uh, later on. It's got to adjust upwards. Um, what what happens? As another subprime crisis? Well, I think it's a, it's. It depends on the level of debt that people take on and is the debt manageable? So as long as the debt is manageable, that's the crucial thing, which is why I was going back to that sort of slightly devil advocates argument that if you can have a mortgage at three or four times your earning, then why can't you have a debt to GDP ratio? I think it's a fantastic argument. And I, it, there's no logical reason why you couldn't. Well, this is, what, this yeah. is it, Daniel. And if you look at Japan, they do have a debt to GDP ratio that's roughly double the rest of the world. Yeah, so until Japan, we can find a financial innovation that would somehow transform debt into something else we haven't thought of yet, which, you know, we might get out of in, uh, in, in, in 50, 100 years. And then you find new innovations or like derivatives products did, they sort of transform debt into something that hadn't been thought of yet. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you were not as a society going to completely let everything collapse. We'll change the rules. Yeah, I think it's very good that, you know, you're, you're an optimist. Uh, you obviously don't think the world's about to fall apart tomorrow. And I think that's, you know, very reassuring for a lot of people who are sort of watching, you know, the whole time watching the news. Um, you know, there's a feeling of, I think there's a feeling of I've got to speculate very hard because it might get very hard. But what you're saying is actually there's just a natural, uh, it's a natural uh, transition of events, I think is what you're saying, but with yes. new, new variables. Yes, it, it's exactly, it's a natural transition. And we've just had very easy monetary policy and that's all we're seeing. And that desire that is within you to think I can't miss out is a characteristic of the late run of a bull cycle. Brilliant comment. Thank you so much for your time. I Daniel, really appreciate it's been an absolute we'll pleasure. We'll put it on a number of different uh, places and, uh, you know, you'll, you'll, I, will, I will send you. Um, but I think, I think it's fascinating uh, points of view there.